Hey, everyone, I think we're ready to get started. Are you good to go, Matt? Yeah, I think everything is set up right now. Okay, so welcome. Good morning, I think it's for the US and um, well, good evening for Europe. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to have you here, Megan, um, on that webcast with me because uh, cloud is a very important topic in most of investigations. I rarely remember any investigation over the last few years uh, that involved like large scale breaches where there was not a cloud component to it. And it's it's great at sense that we have specialists for, for well, almost everything in forensic fields. Um, and Megan is here with me uh, to discuss uh, the cloud forensics part, and we're gonna give it a little bit um, of a memory forensic twist. We do have the chat enabled, so if you got any questions, then please don't hesitate to just put them in the chat and we will answer them latest in the end of the webcast, right? But we might uh, every now and then pick one or the other question out if it just uh, fits the current slide and discuss that uh, right at that point. Okay, um, Megan, would you mind introducing yourself real quick? So um, I just try to move the slides on. Yeah, works. Perfect. Yeah, so my name is Megan. I'm a senior security engineer that should say at IBM, not at SANS, um, but I do do a ton of work for SANS. I am the 4509 course co-author. I'm currently in development to instruct that course. And as you guys can see, if you are here, I also do a lot of research projects, presentations, webcast blogs, things like this, uh, both myself and with my other fabulous co-instructors. So my educational background is in digital forensics and information security engineering. And I have provided my contact information. I'm always happy to try and help and answer questions. If I can't, then to find you the person who can. So feel free to reach out. I do give that information freely for a reason. Cool. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, so my name is Matt. I'm currently VP for Investigation and Intelligence for a Swiss um, a security company called InfoGuard. Um, I've been working for SANS for over 10 years now as an instructor. And I'm co-author of the 608 class and author of the uh, 4532 class, so all incident response related. Used to be at Mandiant, and my master's is in biomedical computer sciences. I'm not doing that very much anymore. My contact information is um, there as well. So let's get started right away, I would say. I mean, cloud is a super big topic, so uh, it would probably help, Megan, if you could give us uh, like a little bit of a, a start then, right? Then we dive yeah. into benefits of memory forensics, we'll look into the limits that we might have in cloud environments. There are a few, but not way more than we would have on-prem, and um, some practical applications uh, where we use that in the past in real cases. So that is the idea. And I think we got started right away. Got a lot to cover. Thank you. Yeah. So essentially, the idea of the cloud is we have this new landscape in cybersecurity and technology in general. You can have resources hosted on servers that you don't own, that are accessible remotely, um, and that a cloud provider controls to some level. And these are these cloud models. You have software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And essentially, all those models tell you is how much control have you given to the cloud security provider or either because you don't want to handle it yourself or just the nature of the project. So these different levels, you might have access to just uh, the ability to run queries, get logs, perform some application um, interaction. So like your software as a service, your email provider, but it might be platform as a service. They might just be giving you that physical service if server in a data center that you don't want to own and manage and stand up and be responsible for, but you want the operating systems, the VMs, the applications you're running on those resources. So varying levels in the cloud, something to keep in mind, especially as we'll see when we talk about memory, whether you have access to memory depends on what level of access you have to those resources. So that's the reason I really mentioned this in this first slide uh, is that just because you're using the cloud doesn't mean you have full control. It depends on what how you're using the cloud. And then kind of the concept in this talk, one of the things we're doing is we do need to take our traditional forensics capabilities. Anything you would do on premise still needs to be adapted to the cloud because when we do memory forensics on a server, 
just because our server is hosted in Amazon, let's say data center, instead of our data center, there's still a purpose for that memory forensics that we're gonna talk about today. So we can adapt it. Um, we should be adapting it. We should understand how are we leveraging the cloud and how what does that mean for our forensics processes? We need to uh, be adaptable with our defer procedures and processes and think about how this new landscape affects that. So. That's something to think about. It can be done. It's the how we do it. But not only can we take traditional forensics and map it to a cloud environment, we now have expanded capabilities. Uh, Viv, our wonderful facilitator today, I asked her to have the link for a webinar. I actually, or a live stream I did Friday with another 4509 author, Terrence Williams. We talked all about how cloud provides all these additional capability for defer processes and we're going to see it at the end of today when we talk about practical implementation of memory forensics in the cloud there are things that the cloud gives us capabilities that are going to completely change and automate and and improve our workflows if you know that those uh exist so viv just dropped that link if you want an in-depth look but we'll touch on it a little bit later and then lastly, another concept that's going to come up during our discussion today that Matt will touch on uh, specifically is that with cloud adoption, we've also seen a rise of like container and serverless technology. Um, probably a lot because of ease of use, uh, the integrations you get with the cloud, in general, just advancements in the technology landscape. We see more and more Docker, Kubernetes, um, serverless stuff, things like Terraform, all of these different things that the way compute resources are operating is no longer sync in just an OS on a server in this traditional point of view that we have. We do have these new technologies um, that perform many of the same tasks and purposes as our traditional servers. We're still trying to just run an application at the end of it. The user still sees the same application, but us as, as responders have to understand, well, now if there's an incident involving that container, how can we get the memory of it? What does memory mean in the scope of containers? So new technologies, the, the whole theme here is we have a new landscape. There's some overlap, there's some new things, but regardless of this new landscape, we still have to understand how do we perform these same forensic processes we've been performing in a traditional on-premise workstation server setup, but on our cloud resources. The move to the cloud is happening. You can't say, well, I'm an IR person and I like memory forensics and I hate the cloud, so we're not moving to the cloud. That's not justification. The cloud and move is happening. How can we do it? And so that we've touched on cloud. Matt's going to talk a bit about memory forensics at a high level. And then we're going to look at the, the morphing of those two concepts. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, there were quite a few good hooks in there uh, that I can start with. So first of all, I think memory forensics is still something that's considered like one step behind, because you were uh, already mentioning moving traditional large scale incident response also into the cloud, because you do not have any other option. Um, a lot of resources are going to the cloud right now. And uh, that is a process that I think is already well ahead of, of what we do in memory forensics. So memory forensics, when I, I had the discussions before writing the memory forensics class was, okay, hey, how, how do you even do that? I mean, in the old 508 class, so I've been starting to teach that class, I think in, in 2012 or 13 or something, uh, we still had that concept of a funnel where we said, okay, we start with the things that we can get from multiple machines all at once. So like small chunks of data, you know, like shim cache data and so on. In the middle grounds, you would have memory because that was smaller than full hard drive images. And uh, right at the bottom of that funnel, you would look at very few selected systems and you would look at their full hard drive. Now that whole uh, system was a little bit mixed around a couple of years back. Uh, when uh, when we were able to apply tools like PLASO to create timelines on triage collections, because all of a sudden you had triage collections that would give you a lot of information about a system you would investigate, uh, but all of that packet was probably way smaller than the memory of the same machine, right? Especially when we were talking about servers. 
Um, and especially today, uh, even office machines have like 8, 16, or, or even sometimes 32 uh, gigs of RAM. That's quite a lot, right? That's nothing that I, I, I quickly pull over the network for hundreds of machines. That's that's not going to work too well, I, I would say. And if the machine is located somewhere else, uh, maybe it's a machine that happens to be somewhere at a cloud provider and it caters for uh, for your customers in Australia, but you are in the U.S., well, then you would have to pull it from the Australia data center. So that is something that could be slow. And this is a, a process we're on with memory forensics right now. What kind of approaches we can translate into large scale and which ones don't fit too well in the large scale incident response world. And that is what we do in the class, right? But there is a lot of value to memory forensics. You just have to know when to apply it, right? Uh, try to avoid that golden hammer problem. That's the thing that's true for all forensic techniques, right? The golden hammer problem, that's something that's coming out of, of software design. And it says pretty much um, if uh, the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Even if it's a, a screw, uh, don't try to, to hammer it in. It's not a good idea to do that. And that's the same uh, for, for all the concepts that we're using here. But the idea of memory forensics is that almost everything traverses RAM. And that is also true for containers. Um, serverless infrastructure is not really serverless in, in that case. It's just not necessarily an operating system uh, you control. But even in that case, you might control the operating system. Uh, a good point is always that whatever the attacker tries to hide is usually more vulnerable in memory, right? It's harder to hide in memory because at the point where something is close to hitting the CPU, it needs to tell the CPU what to do, right? So in, in a nutshell. Also, there are quite a few artifacts that just uh, uh, exist in memory, right? They will never touch a hard drive ever. So you will also not have them in your triage collections unless you pick memory. Little spoiler here, I rarely ever pick uh, the option to take the full memory into a triage collection. That is just, um, I mean, that, that just makes it way bigger and there is no real justification unless you have a very good reason why you wanna have uh, memory in that collections. Uh, some Windows artifacts even are only written to disk or back to disk once you shut down the machine. Shimcache will be one of them, for instance. So that means you might have like a difference between what you have on the hard drive when you acquire registry hives from a hard drive and the actual state of the registry hive uh, like they are in memory. And that is usually not a problem on the client, uh, but it might be a problem on a server that has not been rebooted for the last like 100 days or something. That wouldn't be too odd, right? To find machines that haven't been rebooted in, in quite a while. So what we are hunting for mainly is really data points that only exist in memory or cease to exist on the hard drive, but might still be in, in memory. That's, that's the idea of what we do. And that is what we try to scale. So we have very specific questions. That's also what we teach in the 608 class. And it's a little bit about uh, the management of large scale incident response. Never do anything without a guiding question. And for some questions, the most appropriate answer is large scale memory forensics, right? Not for all, but for some it is. Hey, uh, Matt, but, but no. before we move on, there's oh, actually, no. there's some questions coming in and one of them I think oh, sorry. highly I, relates I, to, I no, no problem. This one, there's one that relates to this slide that I think will be good for you to answer is someone who's very new to memory forensics, ask if you could maybe elaborate, give some examples on the fact you say almost everything traverses, right? Why do you not say everything? Yeah, the, the the problem is some things might happen closer uh, to to the CPU only, right? On on a register level, on on a cache level. So I, I would say when when it when it regards us, then then everything that's important traverses RAM. The exceptions are are um, well, I would say very few, and they don't all concern us. Some that might be interesting are more related to network interfaces that do their own stuff without going through RAM. That is possible, uh, but most of the stuff hits RAM. So even uh, I would say RAM is hit more than the CPU because uh, there is a way in, in every uh, uh, every one of your computers that is there to, to allow you to bypass the CPU, which is called DMA, that's direct memory access. And uh, so that uh, goes by the CPU, but even that hits RAM in the end. So it's, it's, it's very few things that you will not find in RAM. Right and but I to be to be scientifically correct I have to put the almost there, but that's more the scientific part than uh, what concerns us in reality. 
what was there another one? Sorry. Uh, there was one. There was just one asking on recommendations on resources and additional readings related to DFIRST, specifically to containers. Um, I will oh. say I have to advertise for 509, my SANS course. Yeah. If you are very interested in that, we do now on one of our days touch on DFIRST specific to containers. Um, I always like to shout out Cloud Set List by Marco. Oh, let me get his email because I, I, I want to give you guys uh cloud set list it is it just says marco oh marco lancini he puts out an amazing newsletter it is not just for containers but containers is covered and so like today's newsletter i literally got uh this week uh said intro to forensics in the cloud a container was compromised what's next is one of the articles so along with other clouds that one does provide i see a lot of container related articles show up um, so those are my two personal recommendations. I don't know if you have anything else, Matt, for specific resources and reading. Um, not really. I mean, the thing is, uh, we do some container stuff in the six-way class as well. But to be honest, uh, if you control the the container engine yourself, so if you're if you host your your Kubernetes or whatever it is yourself, then I, I can tell you that uh, you will like what we have in the memory forensics class because we do some memory forensics on the container processes. And that is um, a, a very well-performing process to find out what happened on the container. It's it's something when I when I have control over the container hosts, over the container nodes, then um, I usually pick the memory of the whole machine as well, because that might give you additional insight that you do not get when you do the classical approach. You know, classical approach, if I, if I map it on Docker, for example, would be to create a, a snapshot, get the snapshot out and start the investigation on a snapshot, right? But like on a on a full operating system, you might get more when you also have the memory of the running um, container. That is true there as, as well. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, we, we're gonna go into that direction a little bit um, in, in a moment, I guess, regarding the real world samples. Perfect. That was all the outstanding questions. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, limits. Yeah, right. I think you managed uh, uh, mentioned quite a few of of these limits. The, the funny thing is, um, I was thinking about that a lot. So what are the limits? Basically, if you control the OS, it always works. That I think is, is pretty much what you said as well, right? Yeah, yeah, is... so, yeah, exactly. No, no, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say that's, that's pretty much, that was why I emphasized that what's the cloud model. So you're working software as a service, like they're providing you with email and documentation, stuff like that. You're not running, uh, you know, memory tools on a Google Docs server to find out what happened with those files. Uh, but like you say, yeah. if you have access to the OS, you can do what you want on that host. But you will also not do like any kind of hard drive forensics, any kind of artifacts, operating system artifacts yeah. there. I mean, that's that's a responsibility in, in, in your example now of Google or in Microsoft case, Office 365 or Microsoft 365. Yeah. It will be Microsoft. You are not investigating what happens on their backend. That, that's yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Regardless think, yeah. what you do. I think that was a kind of what came up with you and I when we talked about the, the this podcast, the idea of, okay, let's do memory forensics in cloud. And like also when I was talking to my co-authors, that's what came up is kind of like, well, at the highest level, like when we first think memory forensics in the cloud, you're just doing memory forensics on the OS. The OS is just in the cloud. So that's what we're going to see yep. a lot of is we're just doing the same processes, except everything has to be accessed through the cloud instead, which we'll see coming out. Yep. And and that might bring its own problems in the end, right? I mean, there are, we're going to go through some of the options that you have there. Yep. But in a nutshell, I don't really care if it's like uh, when I when I control the OS. If it's uh, if it's the cloud or if it's just um, a, a remote office that they have somewhere, I mean, I remember an investigation where one of the places where infected machines were located had a two megabit satellite line, and they used like one megabit out of of that themselves, and we couldn't touch that. So, well, cloud should yep. be better than that in the end, right? <laughs> So. Yep. And and yeah, that's one of the things I went into my webcast last week of like, at least it's accessible. We have accessibility, which is a big part of it. Um, one of the things I always, when we did, uh, when I worked for the state of Texas, we would have like trooper laptops and there's an incident and we wanted a memory image and Texas is big. And so we'd have to like explain to a trooper that they needed to go to this office in El Paso, get a laptop continuously charge it as it is driven from the other side of the state to Austin, like 12, 16 hours, 
making sure it stays powered on because if it shuts down, we lose all the volatile evidence. So the fact that now at least all these computers are accessible to us, like from any point is, is a huge deal. Yeah, and it, uh, in, in comparison to your example now, we also have the option to bring your, your analysis gear to the place. That is something exactly. that can work with your police cars. Yep. Well, it might have, but you know. Yeah, um, yeah, we didn't have uh, any sort of remote, these remote acquisition tools that exist now. It was all dongles in, in machines. So it's, it's crazy now what the cloud provides and what just remote accessibility has expanded in terms of forensics. Yeah, and I mean, you don't necessarily need all the memory, right? If you know what you're looking for, it could be exactly. less than no memory. Targeted searches. Yeah, I, th I think I have something like that here. Uh, so basically, when, when you put that, I try to put it in like two axes here. So either you get the full memory or you just get partial memory, which is usually process memory of one or a few processes, right? And yeah. you can either analyze it in place, like on a running machine, or you can get it out to analyze it somewhere else. That is, that is pretty much the options that we have uh, regarding memory. And if you want to do the, the thing that I do very, very rarely in, in cloud systems, that would be full memory extraction. I don't really do that very often, but you could do it. But I really don't want to pull that out of the cloud. In that case, I'd rather spin myself up a machine there, uh, run memprocfs or something on that machine and do the analysis there. And that is something um, I, I think uh, where, where, where you can jump in as well regarding automation, right? So there's a lot of, of ways that, that can help spinning up those environments. Yeah, exactly. So like we'll go into a little bit, a full entire workflow of how we can use the cloud, but there's a few things in the cloud that kind of help us with this memory forensics. Um, first, we have, like Matt said, you don't want to create these memory images, especially if you're doing a full memory, you could get gigs of memory. Um, now target across a fleet of machines, how, ma how many gigabytes is that? You do not want to have to pull that down from the cloud to your local system. A, the speed, the time to do that. B, the cost. When you keep data in the cloud in the specific region, there's typically not these egress costs. If you start pulling down all these images, you're getting the egress costs. But we have these capabilities of like uh, templated forensic machines, golden images that, for example, in Amazon EC2, you can select your template, your AMI, spin it up, and it's got all your forensic tools available. So in this network infrastructure, we had our compromised host. I'm just going to plop in a defer machine right there and perform that memory analysis as if I am in a lab and somebody brought me a physical machine and I'm imaging it next to it. Um, so bringing our forensics to the cloud, kind of like Matt said, like making sure that we're kind of bring it to us near us instead of doing all this process of transferring these files all over the place. If we can be next to the system or on the system, that's great. And then I think the second, I guess two more things. One would be the resources. Like I said, gigs and gigs of memory. Um, you don't want to deal, be dealing with hard drives filling up. You don't want to be dealing with tracking where the evidence is, um, whereas in the cloud, you can keep all those resources together in the same region, um, transfer them without these costs. And then I say the last thing is the automation, which we're going to look at later, being able to say something happened, go grab the memory file, drop it into storage for me, and then I can analyze. And you don't have to do all those intermediate steps of let me spin up a machine with the right tools, let me connect to the compromised VM. Let me pull the image. Let me extract that image off of the machine into my environment. All of that can be done automated that we'll see later. So there's all these different cloud th tools that kind of simplify this process and, and make it to where we're actually almost, it's easier to pull memory in the cloud in the sense that you're overcoming a lot of these physical barriers that you talk about when we're talking about an on-premise environment. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that works out. And and what I always say is if you do it more than twice, you should automate it, right? In yeah. Um And if you have like a large cloud footprint, you most likely already have some kind of automation there to spin up forensic uh, infrastructure in the cloud. That is the cheapest way. It's the fastest way. But again, you should only do it on a question base. So what we teach in 608 is, is pretty much the same thing. Never uh, do anything without a guiding question. Um, and the more expensive in, in sense of, of time, in sense of resources, um, in operation, a forensic operation is, the better the justification needs to be to start that endeavor, right? That is super important. Yeah. 
and that goes for that as well. So for instance, I give you a real world example for the, for the, the right hand side, uh, top or right hand corner. So we, we want to look at the full memory, full physical memory, and we want to do it in place on the running machine. Uh, one example could be, uh, let's assume uh, you got um, a ransomware incident and you know that the attacker most likely exfiltrated stuff using Megasync. That is actually something that we see a lot the last time I saw it yesterday. Um, now, the question is always if you want to work with law enforcement to get that, uh, that down, to get the data down, to get the data locked, you need to identify user account, right? Otherwise, Mega cannot support that uh, request. And um, very often, the attackers do delete a lot of stuff on the hard drive, but totally miss out on memory, right? And very often, the machines are, well, barely in a shape to get started. Sometimes uh, people cannot even fully lock in. Uh, and what a good thing to do there is, and it worked for us time and time again, is that uh, uh, you basically uh, reboot the machine because you have to do that. The machine is not locked in. You cannot log into the machine anymore, right? Because most of this uh, is encrypted. You have maybe identified the machine by looking at firewall locks and all that. You saw some unusual traffic going towards Mega or whatever. Um, and when you want to look at that, um, obviously I want to keep the, the memory powered, right? And um, what I try to do there is you got two options. So either uh, you do the Hail Mary uh, hard approach, which means um, when you can't log in, you restart it, you keep it powered, and you do the ZHC exploit, which is where you replace the cmd.exe, uh, uh, the ZHC, which is the sticky keys executable with uh, the CMD binary. Then once you boot up, um, reboot up again into the Windows system, uh, you will have the option to get a system shell without logging in. And with that, you can install, for instance, here, the Velociraptor agent. And with that, you can run tools like uh, Bulk Extractor, for instance. And when I run Bulk Extractor, it has that F option that allows you to specify patterns that it should find, and that pattern could as well be mega.nc, right? And when you have that, you will you are very likely to find something. I mean, obviously, the reboot of the operating system might kill one or the other thing, so you might want to tweak around a little bit. Like, for instance, uh, make sure when you have, like, hefty services running, like SQL servers and so on, that they don't start up on the next reboot cycle because that will save a lot of, of memory, which means the old memory is retained. So that, there are quite a, a few operations that we discussed in the class as well to, to reduce the, the footprint of that whole operation, but it helped us tremendously in the past. And the cool thing is if you have a, uh, running machines and you have Velociraptor agents deployed everywhere, you can even do that on a ton of machines, right? I don't need to do that on a single machine. I can search the full memory for a certain term on thousands of machines. I mean, they will definitely uh, start uh, running the fan. So... Don't want to be in that office then, but yeah, it still works. Um, and if it's it's for a greater good, then well, I'd rather put some more CPU cycles on these machines uh, than than not finding what I need to find. So Velociraptor is a, a great tool for that. Um, e either for looking at at full memories, uh, then it uses the Win PMEM driver for Windows, for instance, but also for looking at single process memory. So if you know what you're looking for, which processes you're interested in, uh, that is definitely a thing. And remember, uh, those tools come with configuration files and Windows also indexes files, right? So even the index or the search index of processes might have residue of the, co of the contents of those text configuration files. That is, that is something that, that also helped us a lot. When the original stuff wasn't there anymore, the search indexer still had um, a sample of that. Is, is that something that, that you think could work from the performance perspective, Megan? Like rolling that out? Yeah, I think so. Time? Yeah, yeah, I think we we get a lot of benefits in the cloud um, when it comes to like performance and, and using these capabilities um, to get around some of the limitations we had before. So I definitely think that's that's a possibility. And those are the kinds of things we have to think of when when looking at these moves from traditional to the cloud. Not only how can we perform our current processes, but in the cloud, but also how can we improve our current processes since we have to move to the cloud. So definitely for sure. Yeah, and it's, it's something that, that we also do a lot. So we always, when, when there is a cloud angle to the thing uh, regarding like full cloud machines, we always deploy every kind of visibility tool that we use to the cloud yep. instances as well. I mean, you need to, and that also means that all memory capabilities that you would have on-prem, all of a sudden you have in the cloud. 
And exactly. there, there are obviously some things where you cannot run it, but even that concept is not entirely new because if you think of appliances, I mean, we had appliances forever where the vendor would not give us access, even though there's a, a manageable operating system under that. It's usually not patched too well in many cases, but that was that was always black boxes too, right? Uh, right in your data center with all those firewall appliances, uh, yeah. mobile device management and so on. There are tons of these, right? So this exactly. is, is not totally too new. But again, uh, you have to have a good justification of, of why you do a certain thing, finding the attacker, finding what they did. I mean, just looking for PowerShell strings sometimes is a funny thing in memory, right? That gives you a lot of information because most attackers, and I, we see that every day, they're downgrading PowerShell to V2, then script block logging is turned off. Uh, that means that you will not find it in the logs, but you would be surprised how long that stuff survives in memory, especially on servers when they're not rebooted. So that, that remains there for quite a while. And it's quite useful that way. So, but long story short, I think we can move on. Um, I'll just show you a few things regarding Lost Raptor, what it can do. It's, to be honest, my favorite DFIR tool. Um, I, I totally have to admit that. I'm not in any way affiliated with those guys, but uh, I, I love them because they're doing a, a crazy job for us. That was um, very interesting when I when I dropped out of Mandiant. In Mandiant, we had super cool visibility with Mir back then. Um, and then we're without that visibility. So everything you learned, you could not apply the same way. And with Velociraptor, that is now something everyone can do that that, that we did like many years ago uh, already. It's it's free, it has a very responsive community and the memory or memory close artifacts are getting more and more, right? So Matt Green is working on that a lot. He put in uh, quite a lot of, of artifacts to leverage memory uh, and you can manage many, many endpoints. That is the cool thing about it. Uh, which allows us to scale memory forensics. Uh, but you still need to understand how memory works. That is the downside of it, right? If you just shoot something at a ton of machines, that will not necessarily help you. And it supports structured and unstructured methodologies. So what's the difference? Structured approaches, you know where to look for what, right? So in a nutshell, when you uh, basically iterate through a process list, uh, that is structured analysis because you know what an e-process structure looks like. You know how an e-process structure is linked to the next e-process structure. And that is how you move through the list. Unstructured analysis would be, okay, this is that big binary data data chunk. Uh, look for a certain string in there. You have no clue where you, where you find it, right? You don't even know which process that memory space belongs to when you do that. But it doesn't matter because you're just looking for a specific string or a specific structure. Could also be like Cobalt Strike Beacon configuration or whatever. And Velociraptor can do all of that. You can go uh, structuredly go through VATs, so uh, virtual address descriptors, like you can do with uh, tools like WinDebugger. Uh, but you can also do unstructured search using Yara rules. You can use bulk extractor even. So quite a, quite a lot of things that we use in memory. I think I even put someone here. For those of you who have never hey, used it uh, yet. But, yeah, sorry. 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 Before we move on, Matt, um, just since someone asked about another um, uh, similar to, to memory forensic tools, they asked what your opinion is about partial memory dumps with a tool like VS Triage. It's a much mm -hmm. smaller memory image, but they said they find it usually has enough data for analysis. It, it depends. I mean, if you, if you know how the memory image you're working on got together, then it's totally fine because then you can predict if what you're looking for is in there. For instance, the, the example I was talking about before where uh, that mega sync process has long exited, um, for that, it would not be the right option because it's very likely that you will not find any traces of that configuration data in uh, the currently active processes. So this is the downside of, of, of when, when using virtual dumping in, in general versus physical dumping. For most situations, um, it, it will be fine. But when you have those those fringe cases where you really want to see the memory that's unused at the moment, then this is not an option. That is, but again, that, that, is, that is why you still need to learn how memory works in detail because then you can predict what you will find in a partial dump versus a full dump. But better partial one than, yeah. than not at all, right? <laughs> so, but that's a yeah. very good question. <laughs> For sure. Me. Yep. Uh, and and just yeah, so you know, um, for the audience, uh, our wonderful facilitator, Viv, has posted the links to the Velociraptor docs and as, oh, cool. uh, is, is posting various links of talks and things throughout the, the chat. So if you're looking at something you're interested, check the chat. She might be posting some summit links and talks or other material. 
Cool. Thank you. If I'm I'm kind of blind here because I have the presentation mode on. So sorry for that. So when you use Velociraptor, it's, it's quite straightforward, right? You have investigation subjects that could be cloud machines as well. Uh, so not a huge deal. You have a Velociraptor server. They talk to each other. So it's, um, well, it's actually TLS, obviously. Uh, they authenticate to each other. So you're not even supposed to break up that SSL connection. If you intercept that, it will break just for security reasons. And uh, basically what you do is you interact with the Velociraptor server. Or you can even put in some automation using an API. So it comes with an API. Uh, and that's a cool thing because out there, there are quite a few very good, um, I would say, if this, then that solutions. Um, so that means you have some sort of a web interface uh, that you can use to orchestrate things. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say SOAR because that is like a different uh, kind of, of tool suites, but it's, it's very similar, right? So you can basically orchestrate Velociraptor together with uh, with your, your cloud infrastructure because all the cloud infrastructures come with powerful APIs. We're going to look into some kind of, I would say, a wrapper. So there is a wrapper that, um, that you basically put over the different cloud APIs. So you have like a common access model that you can use uh, regardless of the cloud that, that lies below it. So we'll get to that as well. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of automating all that, like deployment, uh, the first questions and so on. Uh, without saying it's only for memory, we do that for, for everything. When we roll out things, so um, I'm going into the first call with, uh, with, with our client. Um, I just put in something in, in our chat system. Uh, it asks me how big the client is and everything happens automatically. I get an agent, they install the agents, different agents, and uh, like 10, 15 hunts run automatically, feed that back into, into our Splunk instance. And in the Splunk instance, the first analysis session is already starting. So when you, when you start investigation, most of, of the repetitive tasks are already done. And that is something that, that only works because uh, we leverage the cloud a lot, right? Also on the investigative side. Uh, so that is, that is really helpful that way. Just to look at some of the things. Uh, so what you can do is, uh, for example, getting the, the process memory of single processes. That's very similar to what you get when you when you uh, use the, the task manager in Windows. You right click it and um, uh, and you say, okay, uh, I wanna make a create a dump of that process. That is uh, a very similar. So it's like a, a crash dump that you get there. Um, you can even walk or look at the VATs. So, uh, that that is something we discuss obviously in, in the class, but in a nutshell, that's the the file system of a process, if you want, right? So everything that a, the, a process uses in its space is basically a VAT that could be the executable itself, could be a DLL, could be a file handle, and so on. So quite a few different things, and with that, you can really uh, look at them. And if you remember the the old volatility malfind plugin, that is basically uh, really leveraging that a lot because those VATs, they come with privileges, with permissions. And basically what it does um, uh, amongst a few other things, it looks for mislabeled VATs. <clears throat> so obviously when it's an, an image VAT, so when it's the executable itself, it needs to execute. But if it's something else, then it would be um, a surprise if that VAT is marked executable, right? So that is what, it, what it's looking for. You can play around with that like uh, as a malware author. But if you understand what you're doing, that's a very valuable plugin and it shows you how deep it goes. You can get the full physical memory ranges. Uh, that is also important sometimes. And you can get that uh, memory out as well, right? Get full memory images. Uh, you have to be careful with that a little bit because the memory image will first be stored on the hard drive of the machine you're pointing that at. So if the machine is already at the brink of breaking, it's probably not a good idea to do that, especially if the memory is big. But just saying, full image is something we do very rarely. Yara is very powerful, uh, particularly there, because you can point it at single processes, but you can also point it at the full memory space, at the physical memory space. And that is a cool thing, because now I have that in between, right? Before that, I had to take the decision, do I get out um, the, the memory of a few single processes, uh, or do I get the full memory, uh, which takes me way longer, obviously. And now I all of a sudden have the option to uh, run Yara rules on the full physical memory without ever getting the full memory there. That that means it, that whole process scales way better because I don't need central beefy infrastructure. I can leverage the actual infrastructure I'm doing the investigation on. 
Again, you have to be careful. That is always better in ransomware scenarios when everything is down anyhow. They don't care about, uh, about a few extra CPU cycles usually. Uh, but still have to be careful with that. And that is, again, I think we're going back to that. Uh, uh, Megan, what 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 is what is the thing that that all the clouds would have in, in common regarding automation? If you, if you want to find something that when I understand it once, I can apply it in a similar way to to most clouds. Is there? Yeah. So actually, before we move on to that, did you want to answer some questions about Veloc oh, Sriracha that popped up, sure. and then I can move on to this? Sure. All right, so first we have, oh, okay. So, well, for the first one, Newman, you're about to see that, um, the examples of an automation. Well, he said, do you have examples of the automation sun for the automation server or hunts being worked? We have some automation stuff coming up, but I don't think about the loss or after automation yeah. specifically. So, well, basically, if you want to set up, well, in that case with the hunts, it, it's kind of Velociraptor um, based. So basically, uh, Velociraptor is, is a very versatile tool. So that means uh, you can put your own contents in, right? So Velociraptor calls that artifacts. They are written in YAML. And basically what we do is we sort of um, install our own uh, artifacts that uh, shape the output in a way that we need that. Uh, and our automation is basically spin up a new server, inject um, the, the YAML files, our own specific YAML files, and then use the Velociraptor API to schedule hunts uh, like uh, for the default sets of, of things that we do. So one would, for instance, be um, an artifact that's looking for executable files in unusual locations, for instance, right? So you will with that find all the strange executables that are in the music folders of the public user and so on, you know, the typical stuff that you, you would be looking for in, in low tier attacks. And that would throw out all of these. Then you have another one that's looking, for example, for PS read line, wh whatever, right? So it's it's quite a number. I'm not even sure if it's if it's only 10 or, or 15, it might be more by now. And then all I, of these get started. Yeah, and he did ask if there's something that, if that's something that's shared somewhere that you can share a link to or not, um, but I'm not sure if that is. Um, uh, unfortunately, but... it's, it's not, but it's it's also not, not rocket science to set it up. Right, so the the yeah. th the API calls they're easy, and the the original artifacts that that we base that on they are there, right? So for instance, the thing that I just mentioned with the files, there is um, an artifact that's called File Finder, and uh, that File Finder um, is just something that 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 we sort of spike with uh, with the correct string already, right? With the the correct search strings, that is all we do, right? Yeah. So if you have a list of of directories you would be interested in, that is uh, something that works there. The second option is there is an artifact exchange on the Velociraptor website uh, where um, a lot of people post information that they use, right? And you can just use them and, uh, as a starting point for your own automation. That yeah. is I, good place. And then and I, I'm gonna give one more question specific to Velociraptor. And then I know there's more questions. We're gonna keep finishing the presentation and then try and get to the rest at the end. But since it's specific to Velociraptor, um, Stephen asks if there's like Velociraptor capabilities for a container. So do you deploy Velociraptor mm -hmm. to containers or just VMs? And how do you do analysis of memory in the cloud, of containers yeah. in the cloud? So, well, containers in the cloud, it depends if you control the container host, right? So the, the memory side of things uh, on containers, you can only do when you control the host, right? The nodes, the worker nodes. Uh, but then um, it's definitely something where you can work with Velociraptor because usually you also have all the orchestration tools for your container tooling um, on the host and Velociraptor gives you access to a command line, right? So you can execute whatever you want. And that means you can build your artifacts around the already present uh, um, infrastructure. If a command is not there, if a binary is not there that you need for analysis, Velociraptor can transport it to the target host, right? So even that works. For uh, Windows, for instance, WinPmem would be an example, right? Because WinPmem is not native to Windows, so it needs to be rolled out when you want to get a full memory image. And Velociraptor serves that to the target host. But you can definitely use it. I mean, we do use it for for uh, for container hosts as well. Actually, our our uh, SOC infrastructure of our own SOC is relying heavily on containers, and that needs to be controlled as well, right? From a security standpoint. Perfect. Um, and should I just apply that that YouTube link that was posted um, before 
uh, that was specific to the webinar I mentioned that I did last week, not this webinar. So I'm not sure if you look at the wrong one. For everyone else who's asking questions, there's some really great questions. Um, I'm going to go through this slide. We're going to do a few more slides, and hopefully at the end, we'll have mm -hmm. plenty of time to answer a few more. All right, so cloud analysis environments. Uh, like Matt said, one of the big things we talk about is automation capabilities due to the cloud. Being able to automate the repetitive clouds, be able to... In terms of keeping the analysis environment close to the investigation subject, there's a couple benefits. A, we can integrate it into our environment to use triggers to say, well, you know, our cloud security alerts say that something happened on this cloud VM. So let's go ahead and automate, kick off a memory um, collection there. And that's what the automating repetitive tasks is. With the three biggest cloud security providers, so Amazon, AWS, and Google Cloud, they all have automation um, serverless function tools. So AWS has Lambda and, and some sub tools called things like step functions. And then Azure and Google Cloud both call their serverless architecture functions. And this essentially allows you to, based on a trigger or manual execution, run code without the creation of its own VM. So I don't have to stand up a Windows machine, log on to it, execute a code. I instead kick off this workflow that does all, run, executes all this code and blows it away when it's done. This server, without a server, I'm executing code. It's not a language, you bring your own language. So if you're a Python coder, you can create your Lambda um, and other functions as uh, Python scripts, you can use Java, you can use whatever you want that they support, but it's most of the big languages. So it's a, just the framework for doing this. So in this example, and this kind of um, answers somewhat, there was somebody who asked for a sample architecture design for memory forensics using CloudFormation or Terraform. This is not CloudFormation or Terraform, but it's a Lambda function. We use step functions, which is basically just a visual workflow service to create these Lambda um, code executions. And this one is available on GitHub. So exactly what was asked for of you can get this and you can do it yourself um, via GitHub. But basically an instant is taken, the step function is executed and certain functions are applied. So we see um, it the, the instance, the EC2 instance of the VM is going to be snapshotted, is going to be isolated into a security group. So just like, again, on-premise forensics, a host you think is executing malware, you're pulling it off the network. You're going to isolate it, put it on its own subnet, disconnect the internet completely. You're not going to leave it running where it is while you are suspecting it's compromised. So we isolate the machine. We create uh, this, this environment that we can use for our uh, forensic analysis. We can run basic forensics because it's just using a programming language, Python, whatever. You can use whatever memory tool you want here. So I can run volatility commands since it has Python, it's in Python, you, whichever volatility commands I want against this instance. And then I can ge generate a report and automatically send a notification to Slack. So something happened and it's isolated the machine, taken the snapshots to preserve the state, notified us, set up our forensic environment, done our initial triage commands and spit it to a report so that when we start looking at this investigation, we're starting with way more context than just here's a computer that might be compromised. So that's the power of automation. This one is specifically AWS step functions, but we do see um, Google and Azure provide the technologies to perform these same kind of actions. I think we have another slide similar with some more examples. Yeah, just, just to add one thing, uh, yep. this workflow does not work uh, for memory out of the box, right? So you have to adopt it. So kernel it's for hard drive only if you download it from GitHub there, just to, to make you aware of that. But you can easily adopt that. Uh, that is not an issue. Yep. And there was a question from Zachary about using awesome. Lambda step functions, corrupt, collect memory images from different cloud providers or even on-prem infrastructure. So what I'd say there, um, it's really going to depend on your arch network architecture and everything, Zachary. In theory, yes, because Lambda, like I said, is simply an interface for running 
these commands. So if you can create a Python script that maybe makes API calls, you're running it in AWS Lambda, but you want to do it against a VM in Azure, if the network connectivity is there, then you could write a script that makes API calls to Azure to interact with your resources there. Um, but then you're looking at, do you have the permissions to interact from AWS to Azure? Again, on-prem, you could write a script that somehow um, performs activities on on-prem, but then at that point you are doing the same thing of now you've got to open up network connections, do things like that. So it's very much an architectural question more than anything. Um, if you can do it with Python or Go or Java or Ruby, you can probably do it with Lambda, but you're going to be asking, do you have the permissions on the target host, the source host, the network routing, all that? That's where the complication comes in. Yeah, and, and generally, I mean, those things are meant to be used. Uh, I mean, it's pay per use, right? And they are meant yeah. to be used um, for things that you do very frequently. So I hope you, you probably don't have the resources to do full forensics like every couple of minutes, a new machine. So for that, for that reason, this will not happen all the time. So yeah. in, in multi-cloud environments, it might be beneficial to run your own automation in a real host, right? So there are a ton of tools. I mean, you can start very easy with things like Node-RED, for instance. If it's like bigger data flows, you can talk about Apache NiFi, for instance. So there are quite a few tools that you can host yourself. I mean, you can host them in the cloud, but then leverage the APIs, the different APIs the different cloud providers have, right? You don't, you don't have to, to use... Um, cloud functions just because it's in the cloud. It yeah. must come with a reason, right, again. Uh, yeah, we have one more, sorry. Oops, we have two yeah. more. Yep. So, so, so this wasn't super specific to um, a specific cloud or a specific process, but it's just to highlight some of the work that's been done around IR automation for the cloud. So DF uh, TimeVolve, it's a Python-based automation toolkit. It's used by Google, and it's to perform these cloud forensics. They have um, what they call recipes, so essentially like scripts, like series of actions specific to cloud sources and not just Google, but also like AWS. So like you see in the available recipes, AWS forensics, you can create a volume from an AWS account to an uh, copy a volume to an ana analysis VM with a simple command so that you can start interacting. You can um, do the same with Google. You can export images, collect logs, et cetera. So DF Time will support that. Apache LibCloud is another Python library. And again, it's just for interacting with cloud providers. All of the individual cloud, Google Cloud has G Cloud, uh, AWS has AWS CLI, Azure has AZ. So they all have tools with API interactions. And then lastly, I believe Vivian has actually dropped the link um, to it, but there was a talk called Breaches Be Crazy, I believe at the D for Summit last year. I could be wrong. I think it's the one she posted uh, uh, about 10 minutes ago in the chat. But Recon InfoSec did provide a talk sh showing how they did kind of some of the things we talk about, how they took the AWS CLI, they took their scripts they use regularly, and they autom automated the process of there's an incident, we need memory, Velociraptor can get that memory, uh, then we need to drop it back to us. So they check if they they need to analyze something, they get the time sketch image, they use the uh, Velociraptor, perform this mapping, doing this triaging and sending all the results into a private S3 bucket. So if you want to see an end-to-end -end implementation of Velociraptor and time sketch for IR automation, go check out that talk for sure. Yeah, I think Eric Capoeira is one of the larger users for Velociraptor out there. So he uses that and he's, he's, he's an MSSP. His company is an MSSP and they use that a lot under the hood. So yes. very cool yeah, what it's he good did. For, um, it's, it's been good for them in terms of like multi-client environment. So as mm -hmm. an MSSP, it's not just their company. They're having random companies say, hey, you need to acquire memory for us. So especially if that's your environment, that's a good way of seeing of like, okay, it doesn't have to be the systems under my control. I can implement this to perform client-based uh, interactions. So definitely recommend that one um, and any of these other tools. And in general, it, it's growing. It's been slow, but it's building up the amount of open source um, cloud automation, IR focused things, Terraform scripts, those all those different um, uh, automations we can do people have published okay yeah Viv just yeah. posted the link for that specific talk so 
also also on the memory side, there's been a lot of development, right? Because for years, um, memory forensics was synonymous with volatility, right? Yep. And volatility was not always easy to use, especially for the new volatility version. The plugin support is not that great. Um, and uh, also the, the support is not, not always that great. So when I, I put the class together, there were a lot of like uh, plugins that I would have needed when you look at the issues on the GitHub repo, it would say something like, yeah, it's already in there. You just need to combine this and that plugin. Yeah, well, that was true for volatility too as well, but not everyone is, is that, that well that good in memory forensics that they can figure it out themselves uh, that is why you need good plugins and i i, I totally and, appreciate and that is why you need that is why you need matt's course <laughs> no we're not doing like volatility to... i don't make it hard oh fair enough reason. fair enough but but for <laughs> understanding memory understanding memory better go check out four five three two yeah enterprise thank you memory forensics in depth <laughs> But we use memprotifs a lot because that flattens out memory like uh, like a file system. So it's pretty easy to consume that way. So so you accidentally, if you wanted to click on to the next slide, um, yeah. that is the end of our talk. We have a few minutes, not many. I don't know that we're going to get through all of the questions. But since you just mentioned it, um, Zachary did want to know your thoughts about memprotifs. Sorry, which yeah, question? Any, any high level high level oh. thoughts about memprotifs? Oh yeah, FS so basically, so there's there's a guy called uh, Ulf Frisk. He's a police officer, I think, in Sweden, and he wrote that tool. And the funny thing is, uh, the idea was to mimic something like the Linux slash proc file system, right? But just on steroids. So pretty much anything that you can do in memory, uh, you can also do in there. So for instance, when you're interested in like a uh, mislabeled VATs, for instance, like those injected malware traces. He has a, um, a module that basically finds evil and it will tell you about that. It will tell you about holdout processes. Then you can jump to the process and it's represented as a file system. So you have like the root and then you just go to a PIT folder and under the PIT folder, you have the, the process ID of a certain process. You jump into that folder <clears throat> and it's flat there like in, in the Linux proc but uh, much more digestible. So everything comes as a text file. I mean, it's not actually a text file, but as a virtual text file, right? So you can understand how the, the, the memory layout of that process looks like. Uh, you can get uh, registry hives out. You can get uh, files that are uh, that processes have handles on. You can get out the DLLs to analyze, malicious ones and good ones as well. So pretty much everything that we could do with a number of different commands in volatility, now all you need to do is you, you just basically need to um, to have access to a file system. So that's super easy. And actually, um, I, 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 I try, I mean, the first trials to use that over Velociraptor. So for those of you who know Velociraptor, you have a virtual file browser and a virtual registry browser. Wouldn't it be cool to also have a virtual memory browser where you can browse through memory like a file system? That would be very helpful. But there is uh, one dependency currently that makes it a bit difficult because it needs a very certain driver to interact with the Explorer. And I don't want to distribute that to tons of machines all at once. That's the only reason why currently I'm only doing that on single machines and not many machines all at once. But that is would be quite neat. So very powerful. And he's very um, happy to help out the forensic community because so far only uh, gamers have been using his tools to cheat. So he prefers forensic people to that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, the other one that I thought would be good to touch on, probably the last one we're going to get to, um, everyone else in the chat with questions. Uh, could you actually, before I say this, um, put up your slide with your contact information so that the people who didn't I'll get their to. answers questions can pick up. But the last question that um, is in the list that we'll be able to get to is, what are the scenarios where you do decide to do a full dump? What's your thing that says, yeah, let's not go mm -hmm. process specific. Let's just dump everything. That's a short answer. When I don't know where what I'm looking for would be located. Or especially when um, I don't expect it to be in the memory space of a currently running process. Then, then you need the full dump. Because it, it might be outside uh, your observation window when you just take the virtual memory space. Perfect. All right. With that, I'm going to wrap up because I know we're at the end of time. I know there's there's six or seven more questions, all very good ones. If we didn't get to answer live, 
please uh, take down the Twitter handle email there. As Viv had been saying in the chat, you will receive the PowerPoint slides and the recordings in your portal at the end of this webcast. So if you miss taking down the name now um, or you have any questions that come up later, feel free to reach out. I do see Matt trying to answer a couple questions, um, but if we get cut out uh, beforehand, you can feel free to reach out through to us through other channels. But I very much enjoyed this time. I think we had a good conversation. I loved all the interactions from everyone who attended. Thank you so much. Your questions um, make it all the more engaging. And with that, uh, any closing words, Matt? Yeah, thank you very much, Megan, for being on the webcast together with me and helping me out where I had my blank spots in uh, the cloud field. Thank you very much. I owe you a beer next time you're in Europe. Great time. Okay. Yep. Hey, thank you <laughs> to everyone. Sounds like a plan. Yep. All right, uh, Vivian, you can go ahead and close us out. Thank you so much for having us and thank you everyone for attending.